Hello everyone, welcome to the AOI Streams, in-depth conversations with digital artists and experts to explore how blockchain technology is impacting the future of art. AOI, also known as Art on Internet, is the movement for emerging arts and technology. I'm Federica and today I'll be your host. So let's start this conversation. I think like a good way to start is to get to know you a little bit, Mark. Um, you have this amazing drop coming out tomorrow with our blogs, and we want to know how everything started. How did you get into generative art? Um, how how did your creative career start? Well, I started, uh, well, I think it, I, it probably started with a graphic design school where I, where, um, I was thinking about doing kind of, you know, artistic expression in some kind of way. Um, let's probably start. I was in a band at the time and we needed a CD cover. So I took the job and really enjoyed that process. And um, so I went to, you know, classic graphic design school. Um, and after com completing that, uh, dabbled a bit with, uh, um, with code through Flash by building websites for my my friends' bands and stuff like that, and uh, just got into the Flash community and building websites, and you know, gradually coming into the design and uh, and uh, ad agencies of the industry via programming Flash. And Flash was very nice because you could um, combine um, you know design and code in a way, so it was a really nice stepping stone for me. Uh, you know, I like. I'm a logical person, so I, I, I like the whole concept of coding, but it was a bit, I don't know, it wasn't for me at the time, but when I learned it through Flash, it, I really got into it. And, and since then, you know, programming has been my main, um, you know, uh, uh, art, for art form and what I use in both Void and in, in the uh, Gen Art. Um, and have you, have you always been like a creative person, like growing up as well? Like as a child, has it always been been like that? Well, yeah, so I I, um, I actually so I, my childhood I had in Africa, and uh, my my father he was a civil engineer, worked um, you know in water and sanitation development. So he got some. Uh, we were expats in in uh, Kenya, Nairobi, and uh, they took the decision of putting me into me and my brother into Montessori school, which has a kind of a a different approach than a regular school and I think a lot of you know it, it it's quite natural to uh, express myself via drawing and singing and you know acting uh, or and I think it the origin comes from there because it was uh, you know growing up from about I don't know, four I think I started there um, and throughout I don't know eight I think um, getting that that early in life came maybe I think a bit formative so I kept on always I always look uh, since then I've always been looking at life from a somewhat creative perspective I, I think you know uh, like I said I, I like logic I like building I know Lego was I was a really big fan of Lego there's some and and code also has that Kind of building thing, you're putting things in order and creating something beautiful uh, in a whole. So, yeah, in some way, I think it's always been part of me. Yes, it's interesting that you're talking about um, your time in Kenya. Um, because one of the questions I was going to ask you is um, related to your inspirations from landscapes, right, and from nature. I wanted to ask you if. <clears throat> There's any specific places that you go to to get inspirations, or if it comes also from your memories um, when it comes to your nature and how is that connected to your art? Well, I'm I'm quite lucky being Norwegian and and living in Norway. So I came back to Norway when I was about ten, um, and um, the landscape around here in Norway is either mountainous or you have kind of like, kind of like a archipelago coast. So there's a lot of Know, small islands everywhere and uh, so mountains has become very um, it, it does give a sense of awe when you go on you know on the top of the mountains and look out over it 
And I've always been fascinated by that. And also the, I mean, the Savannah in Africa, we were, I mean, every other weekend, I, I think my dad uh, and my mom just packed the bags, put up some, uh, and, and some tents and food, and we just went out camping in the bush. And, uh, you know, experiencing uh, you know, Savannah landscape. I've been back to Africa a couple of, uh, three or four times since then. And it's always like, when I get into the, you know, safari and getting out into the bush, it feels quite quickly as home again. So uh, probably there's a lot of inspiration from, from both Africa and Norway there in the landscapes, yeah. Oh, that's, that's really beautiful. It's really awesome. I find it very often that when we talk to generative artists, there's always eventually some sort of connection to nature, which at first can seem a little bit, you know, crazy. And people are always like, oh, a generative art is just about the machine. And then you find that generative artists are still connected to nature and they try to bring it back. Um, it's a very natural and, and human connection there. So it's very beautiful. But tell us about The Void as well. How did it start? How do you come up with the idea with the co-founders? Well, I think, you know, um... I think we had about, we, so Void started with four, uh, you know, co-founders and we all came from the design slash ad agency or industry. Uh, we had one architect though, and we all had this background in design slash architecture and we all know how to program or code. And I think during those, you know, 10, 15 years we had in, in that industry, things get quite repetitious and, um, you also start, at least from my point of view, um, it started becoming a bit, um, I started feeling a bit bit bad about myself kind of contributing to consumerism through ads and all this. So uh, we've, we've um, uh, Bjorn and I, which is one of my partners, we uh, kind of since since the flash days, we were always talking about starting a company where we could you know, build experiences and uh, instead of instead of thinking about return of investment all the time, so, I mean, you know, fast forward 10, 15 years later, um, he just called me up and said, are you ready? We're going to do it now. And I went, yes, let's do this. And we kind of uh, got together and found uh, the other two partners. And we just started Void because we wanted to, um, you know, have an, um, a place to work where we're creating something that is gives a bit more than just, you know, the superficial material thing. We want to kind of, have people ex have an experience, remember what you're doing, and you can, in many ways, um, you know, help branding on of the people that are mindful about these things uh, by, you know, instead of pushing your product, you can just give people an experience they remember and you'll get, a, you know, a different perspective of that brand, uh, for example. So we've kind of found a, a nice mix of art, uh, you know, artistry and um, you know, commercialism in a way that um, we still feel we have integrity. That's interesting. And is that something that you felt about the NFT space as well when you found it? Because um, to me, it seems like, you know, you were going in that direction already, kind of like getting your freedom again, your creative freedom again. Um, is that something that kind of aligned with the NFT space when you found it? Well, I would say so. You know, I, I did a lot of generative art uh, in you know the two thousands around the flash days. Flash was very accessible in in that way, and and um, and you know kept that going for quite some years. And I've, and in some ways, a lot of what I'll, I'll show you that later. But um, in some in many ways, void all we're, I'm doing in void is basically generative art, but it's more kind of maybe tool based. Sometimes we design animations we make are generative. But you know, framing it in you know NFTs and blockchain, it it, uh, it, it is a couple of years ago. Uh, my again, my friend uh, Bjorn, he um, he had this drop list of Sisyphus on Artblocks, and I I um, kind of observed him uh, over the shoulder through that process, and kind of I didn't understand NFTs that much until that point when I could kind of go through that that uh, process and ask him questions about what about this what about that how does that work and and then just on, on it just um, clicked for me and I understood kind of how much uh, especially generative art is is uh, just fits so well with uh, you know token-based uh, blockchain 
And uh, so when I learned that, I kind of uh, started thinking about all, all the things I did before. I mean, you know, life takes over. I didn't have, I haven't had that much time on generative art other than what I do at Void, which is quite time consuming. Yeah, so when I learned about these uh, NFTs, I uh, I started, and I, I just thought maybe I can do this. I did this before. Now it's, it's kind of has, it's kind of has a framing that makes it easier to, uh, I don't know, complete your art, if you know what I mean. There's an, there's an end to it. I mean, I'm not sure if it was Da Vinci that said that, but, but, you know, art is never completed. It's just abandoned, which really resonates with me. And, but, you know, uh, kind of the NFT space helped me understand that there is an end and uh, it stops there. You can, yeah, start anew. Why don't we get into the screen sharing part and you show us a little bit about Void as well. Uh, so we get into sure, it. Sure. So let's see here now. Um, all right, so I'll just start with um, I'll just start with Void. Now um, I'll be showing you our, uh, our new. You see this? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. So this is our new uh, um, website. We're building. It's not uh, live just yet, but it's um, it, it helps me a lot just showing some of the projects we're doing. Now, I want to start with Void because um, even though that's that's uh, it's part of me as uh, as an artist because um, yeah I've put, put a lot of put a lot of time into it. It kind of I, it, I identify very much with what we're doing, and uh, up until you know just a couple of years ago, this has been the only way way I have expressed my uh, myself uh, kind of artistically. Um, so I just want to talk a bit about Void, what we do, and uh, before we move on to uh, my general art practice. practice. So, um, like I said, we started Void. Um, the idea was to create something new. Uh, in, you know, I was talking about uh, the uh, the design um, the design industry being repetitive, and uh, you know, uh, what we wanted to do with Void is basically make a new thing every time somebody asks us to or we, we get a new idea that is fun but it's also quite stressful because you, you it's hard to uh, kind of keep the the revenue going because you can't reuse stuff as well but uh, we've we've made it work in um, uh, yeah in about seven years now so uh, what void is is a uh, you know it's a design a, a studio that's worked in the intersection between art, technology, um, art, technology, design, and uh, architecture. And we like to combine these elements to create new experiences, like uh, you know, uh, an art installation, which or which is uh, you know, could be a gallery, it could be um, scenography, it could be permanent public art, it could be you know, um, an art installation and kind of permanent indoors at, at the reception of, uh, of a building or, and stuff like that. Um, the thing is, when we started out, it was really hard to convince people to give us money to make stuff because we were just talking about what we wanted to do, show references, which we hadn't done ourselves. So people didn't have probably confidence that we were able to build what we said we did. So we had to start off by, by doing a self-initiated project, which is the first project I'm going to show you we did. And um, this is what one we call C8, which is a sculpture. Um, a light sculpture where it's uh, in a one by one meter cube, which is custom welded um, uh, through the you know contours of this uh, installation. There's legs attached to it, and um, you know wires and a microchip kind of sending information, and a computer in the base of the sculpture that sends signals to the microcontroller, which again then turns on and off lights. Um, we wanted to play with you know dimensionality uh, and you know this this um, um, infinity uh, infinity window into light and and emulating kind of synapses in the brain. Um, this installation also has audio audio reactivity, so you can you know you can 
uh, hook it up to some kind of um, uh, you know sound output, and you get uh, it will uh, react to that. So let's go back because um, I'll, I'll be showing you a bit of the software that we're that's controlling these things. Um, we have uh, so I. I went through a few languages, started at Flash, and then went through quite a lot of other languages. And for Void, we have uh, ended up mostly, we're, we're quite language agnostic. We use the language that fits for the task, but we often end up do, just doing everything in C++ and creating um, stuff from scratch from our, uh, by our own, because we use a lot of uh, you know input industry standard inputs like 3D sensors, you know sound uh, sensors. Um, they all tend to have C or C++ as um, as a common denominator. Uh, so therefore, we decided to kind of build our projects on a, on, a, on C++. And after these seven years now, we've kind of built up a library where we can reuse a lot of uh, programming tools. So I'm going to show you how one of our applications looked like that controls these uh, installations. I'll just go, just quickly go through two other projects we've done quite recently. Let's see if it loads, there we are. This is an installation which is um, in an area in downtown Oslo. It consists of about 4,700 light diodes, which we can address individually. And uh, we've kind of um, got them custom made in a way that we could uh, screw up some, you know, acrylic um, tubes, which can just leave the light down and you can get this uh, voluminous uh, sculpture slash chandelier hanging in the, in, in the roof, on the roof. And additional to this, there's uh, yeah, four 3D sensors that detect any movement in the area. Uh, and this movement is translated to where ripples start in the animation of these lights. So you're actually, um, let's see here. I can make this, maybe I can do this in the background without the sound while I talk. If it works, yeah, there we go. So you can see the animation. I'm not sure how choppy the animation is in your uh, end, but uh, there's a nice flowing through uh, of lights through this whole um, installation. Uh, we have a, a question from the community. Um, Blemishet is asking, do you have a language preference at this point after having used different ones? Um, well, that question, I've had that question before, and what I tend to answer is probably the language I'm using the most at the moment. <laughs> uh, but no, I don't have any special preference. I'm quite comfortable with C++ now. It's very, it demands to be you to be tidy, which is something I'm a bit obsessed about being. Like uh, to take JavaScript, for example, where you can be as messy you want and you can still make everything work. But uh, and it, that can also be very um, liberating. So uh, that's one thing about Genart versus Void is that uh, I feel, I mean, there's no, uh, I'm more at ease working with JavaScript because it's not that punishing. But yeah, I mean, at the moment I'm doing JavaScript and C++, so I'll, I guess I'll, I'll say that those are the language I prefer at the moment. But there's also, sometimes we need PHP, um, yeah. Uh, you know, server side stuff, databases. Yeah, not that often though. Um, I tend to hate working with databases, but sometimes you just have to. Awesome. I do so, have another question from myself as well, actually. Um, sure. I wanted to I wanted to ask you based on what you just showed us. How do you choose whether what kind of light to use? Because I see a lot of cold lights in here. Um, and then I see the Cathedral of Eagle being like red, for instance. Like, how do you choose that for the voids works? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, uh, the, the video, the video watch, the, actually that installation there is tend to be more warm when you're there. Um, it doesn't always get captured like that in, in the video, but 
Uh, I mean, the color is always uh, appropriate to kind of where the installation is, uh, is situated. So, uh, and we also don't want to, we don't want to, you know, overuse color um, because when you first use color, it has much more impact. So in some uh, installations, you use color and you have to think about gradients and, and, and contrast colors and, and, you know, all that. And in some elements, and you just want the, the light to kind of melt into the rest of the scenery. And in that case, you don't want it to kind of scream color. You want it to kind of go into the background. You notice it, but it's kind of, uh, it's not in your face, if you understand what I mean. So it all depends about the project. So my next, sorry. My next, the last project I'm going to show you is also one we did quite recently. Um, it is uh, called Delta, which is in a public art piece outdoors uh, permanent one. So this is just light, uh, kind of light rivers embedded into the into uh, you know concrete pavement in and around uh, a, a city block in downtown Oslo. Uh, it kind of uh, calls to you know, rivers and um, something in Norwegian called Svaba, which I don't I know how to directly translate, but the, the amphitheater you see here is kind of a reminiscent of how these arch, or how the archipelago coasts around Norway, uh, what it looks like. And, uh, you know, a lot of Norwegians in the summer, they take the boat out to these islands and just lay there and, you know, bathe in the sun. So in this, what you see here, this amphitheater was kind of the heart on, and kind of in the center of the whole uh, block, which they wanted to make it inviting to go through the block, you know, in, internally the block and not, you know, around the block. And uh, the, um, the owner of, these, of this building just wanted to kind of give back to, uh, to the town. And uh, so we had this was completed now this summer. Where um, uh, in the uh, yeah, we, the only thing we are, have remaining to be done is I think we have thirty five three sensors which is going to track movement. This is not tracking who, but only just movement, uh, which will then trigger animation in the river at the point you're kind of walking around it. So it's kind of rippling into the river. Uh, the reason that one hasn't been uh, completed yet has more to do with the network issues and and kind of uh, the supplier of the network in around this block. Um, but it's it's going to come. We did, however, have a, an opening party uh, this uh, this fall, where we uh, hooked the whole installation up to an audio reactive uh, unit, uh, so we could you know take uh, audio reactive input uh, audio input from the artists in under that uh, opening party and feed it through our software to um, kind of uh, manipulate the color and uh, speed and everything in those lights. And we're just going to show you a um, small video where we, I can show you a bit more. This is kind of, um, this is kind of the, um, what's it called, aluminum, uh, tracks where we put the lights in. It has to kind of be watertight and stuff like that. We designed it ourselves like a big Lego set. And here you can see we're kind of putting it together together with kind of brick layers. So they um, we had to lay them out and brick layers afterwards came and lay them. Uh, these, these are parts of the amphitheater. They're, I think, 80 tons each and had to be brought in at nighttime or they had to close out the whole high, the, the highway for a couple of hours and lift it over the whole block and put it down there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Here you can see all the segments of this uh, amphitheater. That's it. that's absolutely incredible. It's been I, I, it's our biggest achievement up until now, um, and uh, yeah, it's yeah, we're very happy with this. Now I'm going to show you the opening party to give you. Here we've had some drones flying over to just um, give you the experience of how. Uh, do you hear sound now? Yes, it's so good. So we had one, a, a few artists set up there, and the action here, or the it was it, um, all 
all the visuals at that point were uh, in real time audio active. We have a question from the audience. First of all, we're getting so many beautiful comments uh, on this. Everyone is just mind blown. Um, but someone is asking, how much time does it roughly take to develop a project like this? So I can I can talk about this project specifically. Uh, we I think that we started talking to the um, the client about four years ago. It took about half a year to kind of convince them to do a test project, which was um, uh, a small segment of that whole installation. Uh, we spent about a year developing that. And when we had that prototype, tested it for a couple of months, so, saw that it worked through winter because, you know, cold is a factor we need to think about when you're doing outdoors. Uh, we got, uh, you know, um, yeah, the project got signed and we were, um, I think we spent about two years on, you know, from, from we got signed till the, the finished product. Well, for everyone watching, every artist watching, it takes time. So yeah. take your time to create your things. Don't rush anything. And it can take one years. Thing about, one thing about these type of projects is that there's a lot of, you know, uh, health concerns. You need to make sure that thing, I mean, there's a lot of things you need to um, think about when you're doing something public where everybody has access, you need to think about people not, you know, um, destroy, uh, you know, destroying anything uh, deliberate or indeliberate, uh, or you have to think about weather, yeah, and so on and so on. So there's a lot of uh, planning and, you know, boring engineering stuff that needs to be worked out. <laughs> For sure. Uh, why don't we, is there anything else you want to show us from the void or do we want to jump on the artist? Yeah, I think we should jump on. No, um, I, I think we're good to go. We can jump on to uh, mm -hmm. more of my generative art. Let's do it. I would want to hear from Jordan. How did you get to be involved with this project? How, what, what did you, what caught your attention? Thank you. Well, I'm just here enjoying learning so much more about the background of this project. I mean, Per and I have been in conversation um, for you know some time on this as it's been onboarded to art blocks for the project of the harvest and just to get more uh, a deeper sense of the background just enriches um, what we're really looking forward to seeing uh, tomorrow when it drops so I'm 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 just uh, awestruck here as well I would just say um, yeah so in my role as artistic director I work with artists uh, when they come on to the platform to provide uh, feedback. Here at Artblocks, I mean, we really are trying to um, foreground projects that are technically and aesthetically and conceptually innovative in the NFT space, especially with on-chain uh, generative projects. And um, we have a selection committee that reviews the applications. And um, you talk a little bit about time frame and how long projects take. I mean, some NFT platforms, uh, you can just upload the script and go that day. And uh, it's very um, quick. 
And uh, there, there are many advantages to that. At ArcBlocks, we have a slightly more distended time frame. It usually doesn't take four years. Uh, it can't possibly take four years. We're not even four years old. Um, but we do have a system of um, feedback and critique and iteration uh, built in um, to work with our with our artists uh, in their through their projects. So I first became aware of the harvest when it came through our selection committee meeting. Um, and we were immediately taken by its kind of uh, technical um, concision and its beauty and also its storytelling aspect, which is not something that we've talked about uh, yet, but maybe Pear will get into that a little bit when he's screen sharing. Um, and it really seemed to push the medium in a new direction. And so that's when we were able to give the green light that we were going to do this project and get him uh into the kind of technical shell on our blocks to start to iterate and provide feedback. And um, after he had the project where he wanted it, it went before our external curation board, which is a group of experts who uh, review these projects to nominate some as curated, which is our kind of um, premier designation on our blocks. And I was not surprised, but delighted, um, as I think Pear was too, when the harvest was chosen as curated. So um, that's where we are now. Then he had another little bit of time to iterate and tighten it up. And he and I did um, an interview, which was just released today through Artblocks' journal called Spectrum, which you can find on our website, uh, just in advance of this drop tomorrow. And we're really just delighted to anticipate what they'll look like, because part of the joy of minting uh, these generative projects is you never know exactly what you're going to get. Uh, you know basically what the algorithm does, but it's only when the community is involved in the minting process that we actually see the project come to life. So um, I know that we're all waiting with anticipation, but um, seeing the whole span of the work that Paris has been doing with Void, I, I see really strong visual connections with some of the stuff that we've already seen. And I think that that's uh, some of what we can expect, but I think there may be some surprises as well. That's beautiful. Thank you, Jordan. That's a beautiful introduction. Um, for, Jordan was mentioning storytelling. And one of the things we were talking about you and I before was um, how poetic the description is. I really wanted to know how that came all together. Um, I mean, starting from the title, really, but the description itself is, is so poetic. Tell us about it. Well, um, well, thank you for that. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jordan. Um, the story, where should I start? I mean, um, this project, project started off with me just playing around a bit with landscapes and uh, finding, you know, trying different uh, techniques. I'm going to be showing you a bit of an image afterwards, but it started with that. And um, I started getting ideas of these beams come on, hitting the landscape. And um, I'm not sure what sparked it, but um, I have to give you a bit of background then, because also throughout my, I mean, when I came back to Norway, I, um, I, I got some friends and uh, that were into, you know, RPG, Dungeons and Dragons, and, you know, tabletop role-playing games, uh, which at that point was really nerdy. It's a bit, mountain, it's a bit more um, kosher now, I think, but uh, yeah, at that point you didn't talk about doing that. So uh, anyway, I've been playing ever since, and uh, a lot of what is fun about that is the storytelling you're doing together with your friends, not the actual game party and, you know, hack and slash, which is fun too, but storytelling is kind of the, the, the most fun part. Uh, so that was probably in combination with my fa fascination for especially science fiction and, you know, science, the cosmos, you know, physics. I'm also a bit into fantasy. All that kind of has made me, you know, read a lot of books. I've listened to a lot of audiobooks uh, these last couple of years, and a lot of that has been, uh, when it's not podcasts or, you know, um, subject literature it's uh, basically science fiction and i think um, and, and you know you get quite uh, when you when you hear a lot of that kind of language you kind of some goes into your memory i think the the, um, the description of the project is something i worked on maybe you know you know refining it all the time but the idea of it came first and kind of 
so I got the idea of how what what these beams were. They were kind of these minions of this entity, which is uh, it's hard to describe what kind of entity this is, but it's some kind of something above our level of intelligence at least, and uh, it needs its uh, you know uh, sustenance. So it sends out its uh, minions and drones because it can. And uh, it kind of harvests its own garden, uh, which it has to keep on, you know, to stay alive, it has to just keep these plan planets and worlds um, uh, in a state where they can keep giving him nourishment, so or it nourishment. And it, it started with that seed of an idea, and a lot of the flesh came um, whilst I was working on it, whilst listening to kind of a different um, yeah, music, especially, um, I'm not sure if people have seen the, uh, the video I put together with uh, where I kind of um, uh, announced the, the harvest being uh, curated in Artbox. But at least I'm using a, a, a track there, which I've listened to a lot while I've been building this. And it really- You can show it to us if you want to. Yeah. If you have it with you right now. Sure, one second here. It's my pinned tweet. Let's see here. Sorry. I don't know if it's just me. I don't hear the music. It's um, now. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so um, that track and the whole uh, soundtrack of The Arrival, uh, which is a movie, uh, this is written by uh, Johan Johansson. Um, uh, it kind of inspired a lot of, of uh, the thoughts around the project while, while I was working on it. And it gave me this, I want this kind of, the character taker is lonely. So it's kind of this solitude, it's, it's, yeah, dark, yeah. That's beautiful. I did have, um, you know, you know uh, follow-up questions um, that I was mentioning to you before, but I, I would love to just start, you know, looking at the process and yep. then uh, we're going to roll with the questions. So I can, uh, let me just start quickly about, you know, we talked about, uh, we've talked about inspirations, uh, you know, landscape, role-playing, music, uh, but there's a couple of artists I'm just going to quickly introduce just to get uh, the impression of what, uh, kind of what are the um, yeah some of the inspiration kind of from artists which I, I know this is an art, uh, architect kind um, Q Ferris uh, which in the twenties I think it was yeah he he um, he drew uh, was uh, renowned for how he drew his uh, skyscrapers in New York and uh, you can see a lot of what he has done is. Kind of capture, uh, capture uh, it, it captures the feeling I want to capture in in harvest. It's a monumental cathedral like um, feeling to it. You can even see kind of the you know crossing, which uh, harvest also has. Yeah. Uh, so this was a huge inspiration, and also. Um, it, for a long time, uh, Michael Whelan, which has done a lot of you know book covers for a lot of the books I've been reading. Um, you can see in his illustrations, there's a lot of you know landscape in the background, which have been uh, I mean these kind of Im this kind of imagery has been inspiration through my childhood because I was always into you know fantasy. You know, real life can be boring sometimes. It's fun to imagine other worlds and stuff. So I, yeah, but other than that, we can jump into, I think I want to start with just showing you guys um, 
Yeah, we could talk about early works. Uh, I can just talk quickly about that. Um, so I, I got into the uh, NFT space after uh, I witnessed uh, kind of Bjorn going through his process with listed Sisyphus and uh, had to start from scratch because uh, I think just after that, art blocks closed for a long time for uh, new applicants. So I just spent the time kind of just working on it, started a mainstream account, uh, account uh, went back to Twitter, um, and then just started working on it. And uh, after a little while, I uh, ended up uh, getting on to uh, Gnome Origin, where I have a couple of um, um, collections. We have Colonies, which is a, you know, um, a reaction diffusion project, which I did, and how to mix colors in an interesting way. Uh, we have uh, some, there was a recursive study, uh, recursive triangles uh, was a study on, um, you know, creating triangles within triangles to build up a texture. So I was going for this kind of, um, uh, what would you say, uh, you know, rock, um, granite feeling. And uh, in addition to that, I've been, um, I'm on, I've been, all my long form art, artwork until now is only available on FX Hash, which has been, uh, FX Hash has been really good for me. It, the, the community there has been really supportive. Um, it was an easy entry. I could, I learned a lot from, you know, creating these projects, uh, you know, how to, you know, build an algorithm that could um, generate outputs and store and show the same every time you view it. And uh, yeah, my work has kind of ma mainly been on FX Hash until, uh, until now. Um, so, see the time now. So I think maybe I should work, go on to kind of more of the harvest now. And the first thing I would like to show you guys is I'll start with some um, work in progress uh, images from the start. So I think this is probably the, one of the first, um, first outputs I made when I started to hone in on the idea of using primitives to create this landscape. I was, I didn't know what yet at this point that it would be beams, but something was going to kind of take the attention from you, uh, from the landscape, but kind of meld into the landscape in some way. And um, you see this, I did a lot of iterating on different patterns and how to, you know, just getting to know how the landscape generator should be built. Because at this point I was just doing some hack and slash code. Uh, I like at some point to just build an engine, uh, at least for this case, I wanted to build an engine, which I could, I could just, you know, write one line of code. I got a working engine. I just need to tell it how to form, uh, how to set it up. All the drawing was already taken care of. So I use a lot of time on working on that. Here you see, I'm starting to kind of work a bit more with the landscape, um, drawing techniques. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this was at this point I got quite an idea of how the landscape generator was supposed to to work, uh, you know, technically. So I went into kind of looking at ways to draw these um, these primitives. To you know, here I was thinking about doing hexagons instead of uh, you know uh, squares. Uh, ultimately, ended up using uh, squares. Might revisit the hexagon thing at some point. And uh, so I went back to the code and then started adding a, a beam. So this is one of the first ones where you could see just, you have this one beam which kind of uh, spreads out in, in two axes. And I felt really that I'm onto something here. Uh, so here are just some, some outputs here. I was you know, playing around with other stuff. And, and uh, kind of a quite simple background or you know, atmosphere. So this one, I think I posted on Instagram, I was quite happy with this result of this one. So this led me on to working with more beams and just uh, playing around with the different variants. And um, at some point I started playing around with more colors. And you can see here, if you see at these points here where these two meet, I was basically ignoring that issue that they should meld. I was just, they were overwriting uh, each other. So 
at some point after that, I had to kind of uh, think about how are these going to mix when they cross each other. I'll get back to that soon. So here are just some early tests of, uh, of color. And then we went over to kind of adding the dust. So here's kind of the, uh, the base, uh, basic start. And I needed to you know, add some energy to this beams to feel like it's kind of sucking it. And uh, here are some you know, very preliminary tests. I knew at this point that this was really cool. And I was already dreading working with multiple colors. Uh, so I just, at some point I was just working with single colors because they didn't have, I didn't have to do any calculation and you know, colors can be hard. So uh, yeah, here's just doing a lot of testing on different, um, on different. We already have a couple of questions from the community. Yeah. So the first one is um, in Harvest, does the landscape generator use a 3D library from P5.js? Uh, yeah, it it it, uh, it uses uh, the WebGL renderer, and I'm I'm using you know as, um, it calls I, I'm using vertices. I'm using the, uh, the vector system that P5JS uses, uh, and I'm, I'm going to show you the landscape generator afterwards. But it's basically you know the uh, the box call to the three API is used a lot, and I'm basically just using box a lot and just putting them at the correct place at the correct time and lifting them here and there. But I'm, I'm going to show you a bit more about that afterwards. Mm -hmm. And the second question is: um, Is the beam? Sorry, let me read this. Uh, is the beam always going to hit a valley, or, or is there iteration where it gets to the top? It does. It does suck some. Uh, some um, uh, some mints will have you see that it it's kind of creates some rise in the landscape too. So great. We're gonna, we're gonna see more of that in a second. But thanks everyone for the questions and keep them coming. If you have any questions, please send them over. Don't feel shy. <laughs> um, and then the very great questions. Let's continue, Brooke. Yeah. So at this point I knew I had to, there's one big issue and that was what happens when the beams meet themselves, especially at points like this. What happens if you have one beam that is has more of a reach than the other one, which you know you had to kind of find a way of how to meld these in a natural way. So that's probably somewhat something I spent the most time on, but this is kind of one of the first results when I finally got it to work. Here's an example of me lifting it up here. What I was got quickly aware of these things here, you see one of the lines from one of these beams here come over here, but lift, gets lifted up and exposed, which, uh, I personally didn't like this part here, so I got a bit wary about that and, and uh, you know, tuned some more of the algorithm um, according to that. And here you can see some more outputs. We can see the, at the points where these meet from one color to the next, um, the gradients and stuff where it's, it's some, probably hard to see the detail on that, but a lot of work in there. Um, yeah. This is also, and, and the way at this point where they are all kind of um, shifted a bit. So each line kind of gets full length and the, uh, the dots there just get insane when you mix them together like this. I'm really, really happy with that one. And just testing out some different, um, different palettes just to see that the system works. Now this one I've been posting about four, you can see that Kind of, uh, when I got this image here, I knew that, okay, uh, I can start looking at, at, you know, setting it up together, building it and kind of making a coherent algorithm that can just take one token and you, it, it creates it up for you. Different, you know, features uh, that I wanted to do, but the main what the body of the algorithm was done at this point, I felt. So I had to start working on different kinds of surfaces. So you can see, um, how I'm playing around with uh, how these um, these beams kind of interact with the surface. I think this is one of my favorites. I like like the jagged kind of feel here and how it kind of repeats in this area. There's also some kind of yeah. It's I beautiful also, how. 
I, I can totally see all the references that you were showing to us before. Um, and especially even from the void um, projects, the, the Delta one and, and the first one that you showed us as well with the lights. Um, it's so beautiful how, you know, we went through all this process. Now we see this and there's all these references coming together. Jordan, what do you think about this? I find it very beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I haven't seen all these testaments, so it's 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 really exciting for me to see how this project developed. I mean, my first impression, really, frankly, is just quite uh, just how refined it is over time and how this iterative process has really led us to uh, something that's really evocative and complex, even though it looks imminent when it when it mints. Um, our final image has so much work behind it and so much thought behind it um, for every little formal detail of how the colors will overlap and mix and what it just it, it seems very refined and very worked through and uh, the more you speak the more impressed I am so I mean that's that's my my initial impression but um but I do also uh, Federica see roots in some of these void projects especially in the fleet one with the with the acrylic lights that come down that are brought through those uh, those pieces of acrylic that are of different variations. And then also to see the movement in the river piece too, and how um, the light sort of creates a landscape by traveling through that topography and creating a kind of evocative, almost dreamlike space. And I see this as, um, you know, just taking those ideas to another level and bringing them to, in a very self-reflexive way, to the generative art um, medium uh, in a way that completely makes sense to me. So um, we're really just delighted to make space for the evolution of these ideas in a new artistic medium um, on the platform and just to create, you know, a space for a more creative speculative aspect of your production to reach a different audience. So um, I think, you know, I would just love, I don't know if you're posting any of these kind of this progression anywhere on your website or anything mm -hmm. like that, but I, it seems to really show the depth of your project. I haven't posted, uh, thank you very much for your kind words. I haven't posted uh, anything yet of this, but I, I there's just uh, not enough time, but my plan is to create a kind of a, um, my, I'm creating my webpage, it's taking time, but at some point I will post this and kind of a, uh, a page about harvest on my own website where I can kind of go through this. But when that's up, I'm not. I can't promise anything about that. But I have plans. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Can Can I just ask you a question? Because I just see behind you that you have prints on the wall. Yeah. Can Can, can you talk a little bit about um, you know how, what a best case scenario would be for a kind of physical output for some of these? Um, generative pieces. I mean, is that what how you would intend them to look, or can you talk a little bit about? about yeah, how? I mean, yes. Personally, I um, there there's so I think you have to see it in the eyes of me being in void too, because everything is interactive. Everything is very technical. There's a lot of uh, stress related to will it work when it's well, you know, within the deadline. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. So. For me, the gender of art has been kind of a safe space in that sense that it's just my computer, it's just JavaScript, and it's a web browser, and I can print it if I want. It's not going, uh, I, I don't know, let's see how it is in the future, but most likely not a lot of my stuff will be animated or interactive because I do that so much of that already through Void. So it's kind of my, my safe space. So I would say print is probably the, the way I think about my own art when I create it. At some point, it's going to stop its animation, so you can create a print screen, uh, which is the same every time, so you can hang it up on your wall. That's that's the way I'm thinking of, at the moment. That might change in the future, but a lot of the interactivity slash animation slash, you know, uh, um, um, the adv advan advantages with using uh, the digital medium will most likely not be very prominent in my generative art for the time being because i do so much of that already i i hear that and they make they make beautiful final images but i will also say there's quite a lot of pleasure in seeing the image build 
the way that you've created a kind of the orthogonal view and the, yeah. the fixed camera and you see the landscape um, composed of all these different elements. So um, that's maybe the fun part that you get to see on your computer. And then the final resolved composition is what one would see in a print. So exactly. That's, 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 that's a, exactly correct because I, um, so I had to add animation to actually not have to sit and wait 30 seconds for it to actually render. But, um, but I made it in a way that you get something extra when you're using the actual digital asset and you can get a print of it and have both kind of, yeah. That's great. Um, so let's continue with, I know there was another party you wanted to show us, right? Yes, I have. Uh, I'm gonna uh, just want to have two more work in progresses, which I just uh, found mm -hmm. while I was going through, which are a bit fun, but it's kind of something went wrong and you get the not orthogonal view. So this oh, is wow. what it looks like uh, when it's not the orthogonal view. Maybe that's something I'll visit in the future. I don't know. So what I want to <laughs> do now, finally, is showing you guys how the renderer for the landscapes work. So I'm just going to set up the actual renderer here. Um, just refresh, check if it works. So what I've done here is just I've just um, can people can you see the um, the boxes big enough? Maybe I should. Yes, I, I think I I do. Yeah. yeah. I'd had to kind of um, I had to kind of add to make the cell size a bit larger so you can see what's happening here. But So here's uh, some code. Uh, first of all, I just want you to know that this part here, don't worry too much about that. That's what, what's needed to set up what you're seeing here, which is basically, I'll just uh, render it again. You see it first builds the background and then it kind of prints out a basic untouched uh, grid system, which is the generator I was talking about. And um, I'll try to go at at, um, at a pace so people can understand for those that don't code. So just notice that we have something called cells here. Now cells is the um, is the object that is holding all our cells, the information for where they're supposed to be. Uh, what height they're supposed to be on, how high they are, all that detail. So what we can do is we can access one of those cells, tell it uh, that the Y position is going to be pushed up maybe by 300, and you'll see what the result will be on in the generator. So let's start with um, first making an access uh, to this, this cell we want to manipulate. So we say, let me start first, like we have cells, the cells has a two-dimensional array, so I can access a cell by sending in a Y position and an X position. Well, actually, it's the Z position, so let's just uh, do it this way. Now, which, which cells do I want to uh, manipulate? Let's say we want the middle one of the whole grid. So that means we need to say we need the cell's length. So uh, what um sorry, there, divided by two. What we're saying here is that uh, the z-axis, which is this axis here, we're saying that get me the number, the, the number that's um, the total of, um, the total of boxes in the z-axis and divide that by two. Then you're halfway through the z-axis. So that's what I'm feeding in here. And just make sure that it is a, an integer. And we can do the same for the other axis, which is the X. So now I have a reference to the cell here. And let's just say the cell's position but y is equal to the cell's position dot y plus 300, for example. What we see then is, if I've done anything correct,
you can see now there's one, the one in the middle is sticking up. I've just added 300 to its position. So I've shown you that principle. Now let's manipulate all of them. So I need to make a quick for loop. I'm not sure how much I'll get into that, but it's a very normal way of accessing all things in a list. So I'm saying that for each Z axis, and then I nest it into there, an X axis. So I have both. I just swap, make sure that we're actually reading the correct. Sorry. There we go. Yeah. So if I do the same that we just did, but just for each and every one of them, I just go like this. Now I have access. Oops. There we go. Now this. Uh, um, every time I'm writing something in here, it will affect each and every cell. So the question is, how are we going to manipulate this, these cells? So we can do it in a very easy way of just doing it randomly. So let's say that the, um, uh, a random value is pull random. Uh, uh, and we can say it's going to be a value between 100 and, oh, sorry, minus 100 and 100. So give me a value between that. And then we say cell dot position dot y equals cell dot position dot y plus the random value. Now let's see what happens. So now I'm affecting each and every cell, or, and I'm doing a mistake here. Sorry, there we go. Yeah. So now I'm manipulate each and every one, but that random uh, value um, doesn't look as appealing or as natural. So um, I'll just explain one thing. What, you, what we can do instead of using random value is use something called noise, which is a function that's in P5JS, and basically every program language has that. But the idea here is that, so in this case here, each dot is aligned through the x-axis and the y value is random. So it will always show, um, it, you see how the values here can just go across the board. There's no kind of uh, pattern into it. Um, and it doesn't seem very uh, organic. Noise, however, works differently. You give it a number, this function called noise, and it returns a value between zero and one. And there's a relation to the value you get back. No, so there's a relation to the value you put in and the value you take back. So if you give it a number, 10, for example, you get a value back between zero and one. Now, if you give it 11, you'll get a value which is not the same, but it's related to 10 because it's close to it. So you'll get a value between zero and one, which is uh, seemingly random, but it's also related to what's before and after. That means that when you call uh, noise with the same value each time, you will get the same value. So slightly modification, you have to noise see the, you have to see your noise though to get that, but the, the idea is there. The same, if you put the same number into the noise value, you get the same number back. So in this case, we can swap out random here and call it a noise value. We have a noise and we have to have, since it's a two dimensional grid, we need to have two dimensions in the noise. So let's say we put in the actual V value and X value. So what I'm doing, each time I'm calling this noise here, it is related to where this the cell we're working on is. So I'm getting a value between zero and one. So, one. so in here, in the noise value now, we have stored a value between zero and one. What we can do then is uh, take that value and we can use that in, we can map it. So mapping is also a function I use a lot together with noise. Map is a function that you send in uh, a value and the minimum and the maximum that value can be. And then 
you uh, also punch in the new scale you want to set that value in. For example, so we know that the noise value coming in is supposed to be between zero and one. It's not more or less. And what I can do is say that the value I want back should be between 100, minus 100, and 100. That way, I can say that the noise value I'm putting in, let's say it's uh, 0 0.75, which is 3 fourths. 0 0.75, so that means the value that I'm going to get back is plus 50, because that's 75% on the way from minus 100 to 100. And then I just put that value in here instead. Then we get this result, which is quite similar. But the reason for that is these values I'm putting in here are a bit too large. So let's just divide them by 20 to scale it down. What happens then? Now we're beginning to see landscape. So uh, what you can do then is start kind of uh, manipulating this. What happens if I put just divided by 100 on one axis and maybe make the amplitude a bit higher? So what happens then? So now I'm getting kind of uh, a more, you know, uh, eroded kind of, uh, you know, ice age stony thing. Um, let's go back to making them like this. I can also just, you know, power the number to just, this is kind of how I play around. I just add edit values to see what, what does the result look like? Is that something I can use? So now we're getting a bit more mountainous and I can also, so let's uh, try something else then. If the cell's position, oops, is larger than, I think, I might have to be testing that. If it's larger than a thousand, minus a thousand, sorry, you are going to say the position is going to be minus 1000. So what I'm basically saying, I'm putting a roof on how high that value can be. Now, if I hit the right, value, which I might have to do a you know, testing of it. I think this would be very bright. We should see. Yeah, you can start to see some tops here. It's flat. Let me just take it down one more. So just to explain a bit further. See, now I'm just chopping off. So in that way, I'm starting to make plateaus. And I could just flip the um, the uh, greater than sign, and you'll get C's. So this is basically how the generator is working. Uh, I'm just doing a lot more when I'm manipulating the uh, manipulating this. I'll just show you. I have some cheat code here. I'll just copy paste. So to kind of generate the harvests real, I need to make the cell size less. Now to generate the harvests background or landscape, I just need to use, use these three calls, which I've built. There's a lot of code behind this, but that's basically, it's the same engine. So now we're just getting the, um, the landscape from the actual harvest. I'm not sure how that, there's a lot of moiry here, maybe. I really could get lost in those landscapes. It's really amazing. I'm sorry. I just, that was actually just uh, my hand refreshing because that's, I'm so used to, as soon as I see it finish rendering, I hit refresh. So I'll uh, my hand away. I'm really, I really like this feature, um, the service feature. Yeah, so that was my demonstration. Um, 
Thank you so much, Brooke. That that was so beautiful. Absolutely incredible. And and we're receiving also a lot of great comments from from the audience. Everyone's super happy about this. So thank you so much. It was really, really great. Um, if you don't have any other like coding to show us, I would love to see the art blocks page right now and what it looks like and what we can find tomorrow. Sure. Um, do you want me to share that? Yes, if you can, yeah. Yeah, let's see. Maybe Jordan can walk us through a little bit of the experience that we can have. Sure. So um, all all projects, uh, the next project um, is the thing that you'll see first when you go to the main ArtBlock site. So this is the drop for tomorrow. So when you just navigate to artblocks.io, you'll see um, Paris project there and you can just click through to this, which is the project page, um, which shows the mint zero. Like I mentioned before, these are not pre-minted, so we don't uh, we don't know what they're what they're going to look like. And the moment of minting Mint Zero, maybe Pear can speak to that, is a little bit nerve wracking for some artists because that then becomes the signature image um, for for the project, uh, and it's the only one that's revealed. But what we do have, if you just scroll down a little bit there, Pear, we do have like an Explore Possibilities button right where it says about the harvest. And if you click on that button, um, it will render a possible result. And you can take that to the live view if you wanna expand it and it will show you um, what the algorithm can do. So you can kind of experiment in advance of the drop and see um, using the random elements of, of the hash, that get introduced into the algorithm, see what possible outputs would look would look like. Um, so this is a way to get a sense before the drop of the kind of range of the project and the um, the different variables uh, as Pear has programmed them in terms of palettes and uh, shapes and forms that you will see. So this is one really kind of nice new function that we have on our site if you want to explore it in advance. And of course, right below that is. Uh, as you referenced earlier, his very poetic description of um, some of his ideas behind the project. Um, and he has a link there at the bottom to, you know, kind of more information. Um, and then below his name, whoops, yep, there his, there's his link tree. And then below his name is a curated artist interview. And this is where we got to know each other a little bit better. And um, this is a kind of standard uh, discussion that we do with all our curated artists that just provide some background and maybe reiterate some of the things that he brought up today and brings up some new ideas. So I would encourage you to um, check that out if you're interested. Uh, it includes kind of a little bit more about his background and about the process of iterating for this project and also where to follow his work. So this is basically how it lives on the site now. Um, tomorrow when it goes live, it will be a Dutch auction format that will start at uh, 10 ETH and will descend um, until the edition reaches its resting price. Um, and it will be an addition of 400. So we'll see those mints roll in as the Dutch auction progresses. And um, if it goes as it has in the past, um, I expect that we'll have plenty of outputs to look through and work our way through um, in the upcoming days and weeks uh, as the project um, uh, comes to life. So this is really the experience on our platform and we are just delighted to host this project, which I think is such a sort of mature and um, efficient and self-reflexive and beautiful and conceptually rigorous um, encapsulation of so much of what you've discussed today, Pear. So um, if there are any questions, um, you know, we have Discord channels uh, on the ArtBlocks Discord as well, one dedicated to Pear, um, which you can find linked um, yeah, through our Discord server uh, under curated artists, current artists. And there's a, there's a lively discussion there in our community. Um, and that's especially fun when the Mint is happening live to follow along with that because uh, people kind of pick out their favorites and have things to say. And it's a really amazing um, thing for artists, I think, and I'm not putting 
I've heard, um, to get real time live feedback um, from the community as the edition is happening. Um, it's a kind of unique experience to this format and to this medium that is um, uh, can be really rewarding. So I invite everybody to kind of follow along and mint if you're so inclined uh, tomorrow. Um, but I think there will be plenty of good discussion in our Block Talk channel and also in Pear's own channel on the Discord server. That's awesome. That's really great. Uh, how are you feeling, Per? Well, I'm a bit more relieved after we've uh, kind of we're at the end of this uh, talk, but I'm um, I'm. It's very. It's been a very strange few weeks, and especially just after kind of. So, mid zero was really nervous, nerve wracking. Um, more because I was hoping nothing went wrong. This is a feeling I always have when it comes to void because there's so many technical issues, so something's going to go wrong. But that was what I was most nervous of, because I was, I was quite, I was quite sure that the, the actual mint would be, uh, hopefully, <laughs> yeah, I had a good feeling about a good uh, mint zero. But uh, ever since, so after mint zero went, uh, what was done, somebody. Uh, snapped up that on um, block talk and started you know speculating so i ended up uh, just kind of uh, pulling back from social media a week but after i went back on just a week ago just after we um, announced the curated that uh, the project was curated I, it's been overwhelming insane great i mean uh, yeah I, I i don't know how many times i've said thank you to people it's uh, very humbling and for a, Norwegian, a southern Norwegianer, it's uh, taking compliments is quite hard. So thank you is probably the best I could do. Uh, I just don't know what to say, but thank you uh, for all your support and thank you for kind words, Jordan. We have a we have a last question from the community. Um, sure. Chair Tasta wants to know if you could comment on some of the most important restrictions for the landscape algo to ensure a great output. Good question. Oh, most important limitations. I think it would be the camera view is how I have done most of that control. There has been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of um, situations where you kind of um, <clears throat> exposed that it was a grid. I don't want people to see that it's a grid. Um, that's just being manipulated in isometric view. I kind of want to trick you to feel that it's real landscape. Um, and at some points you could kind of see the edges. And I've spent a lot of time of making sure that you don't see the edges. And unfortunately, that's also um, that's also something you can't be sure of that you fixed until you actually see that the bug shows up again. You know what I mean? But now it's been very long time since I've seen that bug show up, so I'm quite confident that won't happen. But it's like you never know. <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, uh, the camera control, controlling the camera and the angle it's viewing this on, has been kind of the best tool to handle that. We've definitely received a lot of great questions today, and um, you know, Perk is on our Discord right now, so. If anyone has any other questions, you can tag him. Um, we can talk in the generative lounge. So we have a section under in our code that's called generative lounge. Um, if you go in that channel, we'll be able to chat more. You can you can tag her. You can ask him more questions. Um, so there will be there will be another space to do that as well. Uh, but thanks everyone for asking all these beautiful questions. It's been incredible. And I have one. Uh, you know, could I just could I? And just one thing, uh, something I just uh, forgot about is that uh, for the people that also I, are into sci-fi, uh, the palettes have some sci-fi references, and if you uh, mm. if you uh, get any references, please let me know. We can uh, chat about it. That's awesome. That's really great. All right, I think we are at the end of the session for today. Um, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. We're so excited to, you know, having been able to, to talk to you about this project and follow you throughout the process. And thank you, Jordan, for being with us. It's been great to meet you and to hear the Artblocks perspective. 
uh, very honored for today's session. And thanks, Leticia, for being with us and Joe as well. Thanks, everyone, again. <laughs> and thank you for, for being an amazing host as usual. Yes, thank okay. you. Thank mm -hmm. you all. What a, what a pleasure. And mainly thanks to the artists for bringing this great work uh, to all of our to all of our attentions. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I feel really honored that uh, you're taking the time to talk to me. And yeah, and I can be here with you. Thank you for listening to the AOI streams. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a like and subscribe to listen to more stories from the pioneers of the ecosystem.